The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Clem, and in this episode, we are restoring the Epson HX20, the first laptop ever. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Just recently, I have watched Matt Ergel's video about building the RC2014 kit. This is a basic computer that you assemble yourself. So I thought, hey, I want to do some basic stuff as well. And I came across an Epson HX20, very hard to pronounce, the first laptop ever. It runs Microsoft Basic. It was conceived in 1981, I think. The particular unit that I got was bought in 1985. I know that because I've got the promo materials with it. And also the manual. That's what you get for a manual in 1985. And it even had the quotation for what the original owner had paid for it. And in today's money, it was 14,600 something Austrian shillings in 1985, that is over 2,400 euros in today's money. So $2,500, very expensive. And this thing was a game changer back in the 80s because it basically introduced the world to the concept of laptops. And that's literally a computer that you put on top of your lap. So the HX20 is very special for a few reasons. First, it's the first laptop ever. Secondly, it runs BASIC. It has two processors, 6301 processors to be exact, that run at 400, now 640 kilohertz. You can see how it struggles when you enter a bit more complex programs. It runs Microsoft BASIC. It also has a secondary operating system on its ROM chip uh, that is used for all the external peripherals that you can get for this thing. It has a cassette deck built in, it has a printer built in, but you could get a whole machinery for this beast, like external screens. So you wouldn't be restricted to that little LCD display. You could get a full CRT monitor, you could get floppies and even uh, acoustic couplers, so this thing can talk to the internet basically back then over dial-up and it has an RS-232 port because these were heavily used in uh, robotics and heavy machinery to control uh, very complicated machines and they were even used by the German Bundeswehr up until pretty recently for specialized tasks. I don't know which ones but it's incredible how long these machines were practically used. This one has uh, some errors. The batteries are leaking, not very nice. Uh, the display doesn't work and also uh, some of the buttons feel a little bit weird. So I suspect those may also be a bit broken. Our goal today is get this thing back into working order so I can have some retro computing fun. Welcome to the Electronics Inside, the show where we take apart tools, computers and appliances just to see what's inside. I'm your host, Budget Phil Collins, and that was a really bad impersonation, but you should uh, watch our Electronics Inside. We have a lot of computer teardowns on there. So take a look, element14.com. But I'm taking this thing apart and let's see what's wrong with it. I suspect the batteries, as always. And lo and behold, the batteries are leaking all over the place. This battery pack is not original. Uh, that has been replaced before. I know that the original doesn't look like that. Also, it's made up of some random C cells uh, of different brands. So uh, yeah, that was a previous repair job. Let's rebuild a battery pack by ordering the right batteries and welding 
them together in the same battery pack that it was before. So first we have to take it apart and analyze it. And we can see that all these C cells are wired up in series. So each of these cells is a nickel metal hydride. The original must have been nickel cadmium. And each cell has 1.2 volts. So in series that adds up to 4.8 volts. The original power adapter came with the unit. It doesn't run on just the power adapter alone. It needs the internal battery. That's a quirk of that machine. Uh, you can power it up uh, with 5 volts directly on the battery terminals, but the printer and the cassette deck won't work. To get full functionality, I have to rebuild the battery pack and I want to weld it, not solder it. So I've bought a little battery spot welder some safety gear because safety for it kids and let's try to weld up a battery pack. Welding up the battery pack is pretty cool. Um, here's a pro tip. Never rip off the contacts when you get scared. That will only lead to more spray and more fire and stuff. Keep your calm and do one point after the other and don't be afraid of the sparks. Test fitting the battery pack leads me to the conclusion that I'm uh, a little bit dumb because I've looked at the right battery size on the ordering page at Element 14 and I ordered uh, D cells instead of sub C because I didn't check what I clicked. Great. So now I have to wait for more cells uh, to build up that battery pack again. Hopefully then we can try to boot up the machine. So while I'm waiting for all these other cells, I'm taking the unit completely apart. I look at every cap that is on there. I replace them if I see they are faulty or if I have the right values in stock. Some of them are a little bit special, so replacements is usually not that hard, but you need to have the right values, not just any cap. And also have the right size to make sure everything still fits in there. We can see the processors, the 6301 dual processors, so two processors in there, um, they run at 630 kilohertz. Uh, I'm not sure how this unit works specifically, I'm not an expert on this, but it seems that uh, one does the main program executing task and the other one is used for general I.O. So maybe one of them looks at the keyboard and controls the peripherals and the other one does the real computing. Also, um, you can see there is a lot of RAM on the board. There was a RAM expansion card that you can install in there. And you have individual ROM chips and these all contain uh, one basic ROM. And there is a dip switch on there. If you put that dip switch in different uh, modes, then you can change the language and you can also change the operating system. Number four changes from the usual basic that uses only the internal screen and the internal peripherals to uh, the disk basic, which would load from a disk system that you have to attach to the device. So that would enable you to use an external CRT monitor and graphics mode. So building a terminal that would be compatible with that to use that graphics mode would be a really cool future project. Leave it down in the comments if you would like to see such a project. I'm Karen Corbeil, host of The Learning Circuit, a show where we learn about electronic components and concepts, then apply what we learn by building projects. Look for new episodes of The Learning Circuit on Wednesdays and connect with me on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash the learning circuit. Happy learning! Absolute fun fact, you can still get the paper for the printer, that's the standard size, but you can also get the ink ribbons. They are still manufactured, they're not outdated. These are used in receipt printers for a lot of shops and the like. So you can still get brand new ones. And I even have a replacement ribbon that came with the machine. And it seems it's dried out. So I won't be printing in this episode, but it's nice to know that I can still get replacements. 
The computer came with some cassettes. These are just normal micro cassettes that you would use for dictation machines. And some of them have writing on them, Hauskosten ab 1985, which means uh, bills I have to pay for my house starting with 1985. So somebody used that for accountancy. And here is the printed map for where you would find which specific set of data. So the counter zero to 87 would be the gas bills. And 193 would be uh, electrical bills. Great. I didn't expect games, but that's a little bit underwhelming. It seems that this cassette has games on it. There are a lot of examples. On 1500 there's squash, rifle and snow. Oh, and seems the user programmed his own game. He used a pen to add Lotto. While I have the unit apart, I also try to get all the buttons working. So I'm cleaning everything. Usually with these old keyboards, it's eras of dirt and grime that make them non-functional. So I use contact cleaner, a special kind that you can use on live electronics. That makes sure that I won't ruin anything with solvents or stuff like that. So I want to be gentle on the PCBs so I won't ruin a nearly 40 year old piece. Then bring it all together. Also make sure that I don't hurt the ribbon cables and connect it to the rebuilt battery pack and let's see what it does. Well, it does beep sometimes, but I don't get any picture or nothing on the screen. But usually beeping is a good indication. Beeping has, it has booted correctly. And it also means that there is a connection from the motherboard where all the functioning components are over to the keyboard and over to the display because those are connected via two ribbon cables to the main computer. So I know that interconnection works at least partially. After a lot of poking around, I can see the shimmer of signs on the display. It's very hard to tell on camera, but there's letters that could mean basic. So it lives, there is something, but it's very faded and dim. I need to get a little bit more into that. Play around with contact spray and cleaning the paths. Make sure that everything works. Maybe charge it a little bit more. We're getting somewhere. After poking around a while and making sure all the contacts work and having it charged and stuff, I finally got the display to work. It, I even disassembled it to make sure all the contacts are okay. So it now shows a picture. It's a garbled mess, but I've already Googled that. Uh, I need to reset the processor and then it should work. But it has the worst viewing angle that I have ever encountered on an alphanumeric LCD. If you remember how the original Game Boy was awful to look at in the dark, it's even worse. So there is only one angle where you have to position the unit at exactly that angle to even be able to read anything and just moving a little bit to the side or to the front makes it vanish. So <laughs> it finally displays a picture and uh, the R button still needs a little bit more lubrication. All the other buttons I got to work, but the R button is stubborn. <sighs> but we finally got it booting. So let's see how we can button this up and make sure it doesn't break on us again. Reset the, the unit. It seems to be uh, pretty particular in, like, let's say it's easy to break it with uh, code or with some button pushes that you were not supposed to do. And then we can try out some programs. Let's see. Yeah! It lives! 
It lives! <laughs> Look at it go! Of course I tried to load some software from the cassettes that were in the box for this unit. Uh, but I couldn't get it. I only get I.O. error and the drive seems to be blocked or something. I won't dig into that drive. I've googled before and it turns out that's pretty hard to repair so I, I won't destroy it. So I'm very careful with it. So it's beyond that scope. I've also uh, read in the manual, in the big honking manual, about the sound command. So let's use the sound functionality of the HX20 because the screen is not so great apparently. That sounds pretty cool for a 1980 something machine. This unit is of course not the most powerful computer of its time, but it was an absolute milestone in portable computing and it still has some retro uses today. It just, it's, just a, it's just a great computer. Computers of that era can run into traps. There is even a cheat sheet for getting it out of a system lock right in the package. So that's something you have to cope with when you're dealing with such old machines. So my Epson HX20, the first laptop ever, is back into working order and it's so much fun to play around with this thing. If you have restoration projects that you are going to tackle, let us know on the Element 14 community and share your findings. It's really fascinating to see how damaged and old some of these computers can be and still get back into working order. That's fascinating to me. I gotta go. There's another project waiting for me and I can't wait to see you on a community.